difference in my, um, you know, my my Kabbalistic. Um, well, well, I, I've been well, I've been practicing Kabbalistic, uh, reading about the Kabbalistic uh, magic, and you know, we have the White Raven show to do. Yeah, no, yeah, we got a special guest. Yes, he's here right now. Yeah, we got him right here. His name is Lon Milo Dequette, um, a an esteemed occultist writer. Um, yeah, um, perhaps. Uh, can you hear me all right, Mr. Dequette? Yes, yes, I can. Play some more. <laughs> you know, I, I, I actually, I've, I've actually, I've actually. Um, seen that you also are a musician is that correct uh y y yes i i have pretenses to that effect yes so you have pretenses to that effect and um because because i've actually heard some of your music and unless that, that is not unless that's your clone um but where can where, where can we find your music actually you know what i think i think i, I listened to it on reverb nation so if yeah, Reverb Nation uh, is the easiest way to uh, uh, hear pretty much my whole catalog of uh, of things uh, for free. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm on, you know, um, I hate to say it, Spotify, and uh, uh, all of those other things, and you know, you can. Find me usually where music is sold. Hmm. Spotify, Sp Spotify is not bad. Um, so, how, how long have you been, uh, you know, performing music? Because I've seen you play the guitar. Uh, oh, 60 years. Wow. Well, uh, well since I was fourteen. Right, fourteen. Yeah. That that's a that that's a good stretch. Um, <laughs> yeah. in, in, how about insp inspiration wise um, uh, pe people that ins ha have inspired you from you know in your youth perhaps for, for mu your musical oh, yeah, yeah I was always uh, uh, I always considered music as a as a vehicle for uh, uh, sort of philosophical or, or uh, uh, social awareness type thing so I uh, Sort of came to age and and started uh, 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 professionally uh, working when I was fourteen, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, I was coming to age in the mid mid sixties. So my heroes were uh, uh, the socially conscious folk singers, uh, Pete Seeger. Uh, Woody Guthrie, Bob mm -hmm. Dylan, Bob uh, Dylan, and uh, then that evolved into folk rock, you know. Mm -hmm. So I uh, like that kind of stuff. But I always uh, uh, wasn't so much involved in cover bands or anything like that. I always wrote my own music or, or in partnership uh, with others. So uh, when I got signed with uh, Epic Records in uh, 1969. Um, so it was just recording our own music, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So do you remember the first song that you actually wrote yourself or composed? Uh, no. You don't. Okay. Do you, do you ha okay? Do you have a, a most a most memorable? Let's, song? let's let's see. I I I don't I don't know. I think there is uh, uh, early songs I wrote with with Charlie D were sort of uh, uh, psychedelic acidy things. There was uh, 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 T Winkle Park and. Uh, crazy things like this, Mr. Muggles. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was before Muggles was a, was a term for non-witches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's taken from the Harry Potter series, ain't it? Muggle? Muggles is from, yeah, from Harry Potter. But Muggles was the, was the, the old 1920s and 30s uh, word for marijuana. 
Oh, wow. That I did not know. That I did not know. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> right. So is there, as far as, far as song, songwriting goes, is, is there, okay, let, let me ask it this way. When you, when you create music um, on your guitar or, or any other instrument, um, and when you write the lyrics to these said um, songs, do you think that when you perform them, it is an aspect, could you call that act in itself magic? Yes. Yes. And why do you, okay, why would that act be magical? Uh, well, everything is magic. Every act, every willed act is magic. But uh, uh, most especially uh, uh, acts or events that, that uh, cause a change in consciousness. And uh, so when you, when you write a poem or a song or a book or anything else, you're, you're directly in a very uh, direct but invisible way affecting the consciousness of someone else. And uh, yeah, it, you don't get any more magical than changing consciousness. So, so music. So, what you're saying is, music has the capability to give someone um, alternative states of consciousness. Well, sure. Even a conver our conversation is changing consciousness, both between us and whoever is listening. So it, it's already doing that. You can't, you can't uh, avoid it. So uh, if, you, if, a, if a chance conversation can cause great changes in say socio-political socio uh, environment, uh, yeah, uh, imagine how much uh, uh, a fixed or a concentrated uh, uh, will or an act. If if a if a chance thought can create a great change, what what cannot a fixed thought do? So, in a, in a sense, magic is just causing any kind of change to occur in conformity with will. Hmm. And uh, most of the time, we're not in touch with what the hell our will is, or. Uh, and so uh, we, we're just causing change to occur <laughs> in nonconformity to our will and just uh, uh, bounce through life as a hit and miss affair. Hmm. Mr. Duquette, are, are you familiar with um, Alistair Crowley? Uh, well, he's dead. How much can I? <laughs> I'm. I'm pretty familiar with his uh, with his work. Yes. Are you familiar with um, one of his uh, his books called The Book of the Law? Yes. Um, concerning the Book of the Law, um, that particular text. Do you think that that particular text was aimed at the age of Aquarius that we're living in right now? Uh, Not as such. It was uh, uh, a document that gave voice to to what is uh, uh, what it itself uh, refers to as uh, uh, the age of Horus. So uh, astrological ages are a bit different than uh, magical ages. Uh, where the confusion comes in, it's uh, uh, coincidental that the astrological ages, which, you know, the debate is about 2,100 years as the uh, uh, procession of the equinoxes uh, makes the sun appear to... Uh, uh, sort of go, travel backwards through the signs of the zodiac about uh, one full sign about every 2100 years 
So, so uh, astrological ages are just ticks on the clock. Okay, it's like a machine. It's just measuring ticks on ticks on a clock. And uh, the astrological ages have, uh, uh, at least we can meditate upon them and uh, observe in the, the consciousness of humanity as a whole as we pass uh, through these various ages. Uh, the characteristics that... Uh, have over the years been traditionally applied to the signs of the zodiac. So the, uh, when you say age of Aquarius, let's just say the age of Aquarius uh, uh, probably kicked in around the turn of the 20th century. Hmm. Maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later. I don't know. I'm not an astrologer. I'm a songwriter. <laughs> You're a, you're a songwriter and also in, in, in a, you're a songwriter and in opinion you're also an esteemed occultist in opinion well be that as it may let's say it happened it happened around the the turn of the 20th century uh, and uh, so the the sun appears to be or behind the sun at the, at the equinoxes the, the idea is that the, the Aquarius is filtering through the sun and the sun is showing, shining on us. So, so we're feeling that ex, eso, exoteric, the outward everyday consciousness, we're feeling the exoteric uh, uh, effects of the sign of Aquarius filtered through the sun. But right behind us, 180 degrees away, Leo is blasting us in the behind <laughs> full force. Okay. So these, these astrological ages were actually shish kebobbed on the pole of, of uh, one sign of the zodiac and its opposite sign. So in a sense, we're, we're also in the age of, of Leo. Uh, and uh, the, the effects of the, of the full force of the sign of the zodiac right behind us uh, affects us on a, on a spiritual or more esoteric uh, way. Like in the, in the sign of Taurus, mm -hmm. the... Uh, Egypt was was uh, at its zenith, okay, and the 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 people, the exoteric worship was that of the bull, the bull of of uh, uh, Apis. Mm -hmm. So that was you know this there's there's uh, uh, Taurus, then there's the sun filtering the Taurian thing at us. But right behind us was Scorpio. And even though the priests of Egypt were leading the bull in, in all the public worship ceremonies, they had the Urius serpent, a Scorpio. They, the esoteric magic, if you will, of uh, uh, Egypt was more hardcore Scorpio in nature do you, am i making any sense here at all well it, it certainly makes sense when when uh, with the um well you know kundalini almost with the, with the serpent perhaps right right yeah i mean okay. that definitely that definitely makes sense so in a sense now that that the sun's in aquarius we're getting a straight shot of of leo and mm -hmm. this this is where we start to, to to uh, uh, have a glimpse of understanding what Crowley was talking about when he talked about the beast mm -hmm. and, and what uh, 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 John was talking about in the book of the Revelation with the, with, with the beast, okay? Uh, because it's a Leo thing that's happening. But the magical age is different than the astrological ages. Magical ages are 
uh, directly relative to the general level of consciousness of humanity as a whole. And so an astro, uh, a magical age could be of any length. It just kind of happens that the, the, the current magical age more or less started about the same time as this astrological tick on, on the clock of the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And the, the magical ages have everything to do with humanity's as a whole, humanity's self-identity or the a level of awakeness, mm -hmm. okay? Of, uh, and so uh, uh, the book of the law, it's not a textbook. It's, it's like a, a, a channeled poem a three-part channeled prose poem thing. Mm -hmm. you, know, it's a, you don't read it like a text and you don't uh, interpret it for anybody else. But, mm -hmm. but uh, the idea of, of humanity as a whole waking up along an evolutionary path uh, uh, more or less dictates uh, the formula of worship of every age. And if we would go back, well, Crowley at least suggested in, in his way of trying to explain this, that within human memory, there's been three major ages like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, two ages ago, and he, he gave the the title, just for convenience sake, not because there's a connected to Egyptian culture or anything like that, but for convenience sake, uh, he labeled them the age of Isis, that's two ages ago, the age of Osiris, which was last age, and the age of Horus, their, their son. Okay, so it's mother, father, then the child. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the the age of Isis was a, a period of human consciousness where we actually did not have a nine month attention span. We did not know where babies actually came from. We couldn't put two and two together there, and we weren't so much worried about anything but what was going to fill our stomachs in the next hour or two. And so we observed that life, other human beings, life came directly out of a woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, It blew everybody's mind. My God, she, she's God. Because not, not only that, but in, in, in tune with the, with the cycles of the moon, she bled. Okay. When me and my my men, manly men go out to hunt, okay, we get gored by a boar or something, and we bleed and we freaking die. <laughs> but the woman bleeds every month, <laughs> and she doesn't die, okay? Not only that, but when she stops bleeding, she swells up for nine of those moon cycles, and all of a sudden she just pops and out comes in blood and water, out comes a little og, <laughs> another little caveman or cave woman just comes popping out of her. Just, I mean, what's more godlike than somebody that can create another living human being? Seemingly all by herself. Mm -hmm. And we also thought that, that uh, uh, other nourishment, the plants, the animals that we ate, come directly out of the earth. The earth provides that to us. So the formula of worship was the woman and the earth. And all magical and religious and spiritual 
behavior and observances were based around this wonderful, miraculous goddess worship. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. After a while, we figure out where babies come from. Not only that, we start to wake up a little and become conscious of our, our self-identity on this plane of existence. And we realize that, you know, in the winter time, when the daylight is very short, the plants don't grow, the animals don't come. Uh, not only that, but you know, if the woman doesn't have some kind of uh, recreational behavior with a man, she's not going to stop bleeding. She's not going to... Oh, I oh, and so we put two and two together that without the penetrating, the penetrating rays of the sun in the ground, the plants won't go. And without the penetrating relationship of the man, the woman will remain barren. So mm -hmm. the the next age was okay, this is a partnership situation between the sun and the earth between the man and the woman and all of a sudden fatherness becomes gotcha. becomes right. a factor yep. and just because we're we're crazy humans when that pendulum started to swing back it's it swung back in a terrible uh, oppressive manner and the entire patriarchy thing took over with a vengeance mm -hmm. but a lot and that was a little bit better uh perception of reality okay just a little bit better but it was enough for another age and all of a sudden the father god became such an important thing Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and it reflected in politics, in, in armies, in culture. And uh, the woman got herself subjugated under that patriarchal bullshit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not only that, but along with that came the destruction of the innocence of our self-identity. Because once we started to identify with that father's son, the son that goes down every night, it dies. And who knows if it's coming back up in the morning. And it teeters toward the south when we're in the northern hemisphere. It teeters toward the south uh, at the wintertime. Who knows? It may just keep going south and it'll... It'll be like Game of Thrones. It'll be like the long night, you know, and so it freaks us out. And so we became obsessed with death. And we became obsessed with the formula that we do observe. The sun does come up, but only because it dies. And the plant does grow up, form a seed, and the seed, and the plant dies, but the seed falls dead in the ground, and the seed comes back to life. So they figured out, oh, the magical religious formula is now life comes from death. So as long as we keep killing stuff, we please the God by killing stuff for the God. So mm -hmm. that, that led into an entire uh, mindset of sacrifice. Baal? Everybody. Mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. Right. Gotcha. Osiris. Okay. Mm -hmm. Especially Osiris. Osiris. Riven and slain, right. Yeah. Is the, is the perfect uh, allegory for mm -hmm. this whole thing. And it's just you, all you have to do is change the guy's underwear and to go from Osiris to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was the age of Osiris. Hmm. And that's the age that ended 
around the turn of the century. And it ended around the turn of the century, not because of any religious movement or any prophet got a revelation or anything else, but because finally, it finally sunk in to enough of humanity that the sun does not die, that the sun stays on all the time. And so we don't identify with the dying sun. We don't identify with the earth so much, okay? We tinker just a little bit with a little bit better uh, perception of reality. The sun stays on all the time. We stay on all the time. Mm -hmm. There's never been, if we're conscious now, consciousness is continual. You don't have to ooga booga. You don't have to bargain with God. Okay, to, to, to live after you die. No, you're on all the time. Death is as much as an illusion as the fact that we are in each in our own shadow at night and that the sun stays on all the time we're now identifying with the sun and that sun that consciousness that deep down inside even though we we think we die we know deep down inside the sun stays on all the time and so we know deep down inside that we stay on all the time. And the more we wake up to that fact, uh, the more in tune we are with who we are. Mm -hmm. So that's the age of Horus. And that's as fast as I can explain that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, and that's and that's a, that's a great uh, perspective, perspective, one that I've probably never heard. Um, so we, you would suggest that we are in the age of Horus as of now. Is that correct? Yeah, well, you know, I can't say for sure we haven't already moved out of the age of Horus. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, uh, it, it, because it's kind, it's kind of complicated and um, everything is complicated by the fact that time as we know it doesn't exist mm -hmm. with consciousness. We take time out of the equation and then all of our conversation, we just may as well go to the bar and just order another round. Mm -hmm. uh, the adherence the people that finally get themselves in tune with the, the formula of the age mm -hmm. more or less manifest the, the, the formula in, in their life, okay? But the, the, the masters of an age, it's their job to usher in the coming age, okay? Uh, I'm going to use an example. It's, pro it's probably a very inaccurate example. Um, in the age of Osiris, mm -hmm. and, and let, let's say the uh, right smack dab in the middle of the age of Osiris, the, the, the whole formula of what... Uh, the original purity of what the, the message of early Christianity was had degenerated, had decayed, had crystallized into the nightmare of, of the Crusades, let's say, which is just a freaking nightmare. It turned, mm -hmm. it turned that original message on its head. Senseless blood. Yep, I agree. It, Prince of Peace, kill everybody that's not us, you know, yeah. <laughs> and kill us that's not us enough, you know. Um, wow. But so the 
crusaders, let's say, were manifesting the formula of that age of Osiris. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there are little things, there are little bright spots, okay, coming out of that crusade, coming home to Assisi with blood on his hands was St. Francis, okay? And St. Francis got illuminated through that formula. And St. Francis's whole thing was, oh, no, it's the, we're doing this to bring to light the, 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 the innocence, the love, the, 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 the freshness of the baby Jesus. Horus, mm -hmm. the child, okay? He was working and his work as a manifester of the formula, his work was to actually help bring in the new age that, that, that followed. So when you ask me, are we in the age of Horus? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on if you're a manifester or if you're an adept. Hmm. So uh, we're pretty smack dab in the middle of the manifesting thing. We're acting like a child. Humanity is acting like a spoiled brat. Right. We're throwing sand in each other's eyes in the sandbox. We're being cruel. We're burning mm -hmm. ants with a magnifying glass. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. We're still innocent. We're still beautiful. We're still growing. Okay. But, but in a sense, we are at that crusader stage of of the the age of Horus as far as the manifestors of the age. At least this is how I'm seeing it uh, sitting here as a 72 year old, oh, 73 year old person who lies about their age. Okay. Mr. Duquette, do you believe in the occultic anxum that love is the law? Um, love under, under under will, I think that was it. Uh, it's self-evident, yes. Self-evident. Does that have a lot to do with, with some of the uh, the rhetoric that you were just talking about? Well, the, the, the idea that if we truly understood what we were here for, uh, we would understand that we're really... Uh, we're really not, uh, well, look at it this way. We wouldn't be breathing. We wouldn't be here talking to each other. We wouldn't be living. We wouldn't be born. We wouldn't exist unless there, we have a function. And that function is something that only we can do. Maybe a big thing, maybe a small thing, it doesn't matter. It's a big thing because it's the only thing that we're here to do. And nobody else can do it. If somebody else could do it, we'd be somebody else. But we're not. We're who we are. We're here to do something. Mm -hmm. And and if there wasn't something left undone that only we can do, then we wouldn't even be having this discussion. And so that one thing that we're here to do is our will. and Or we could call it our will. And if we truly understood it, it would be the exact same thing that all of the other mystics of the previous ages called the will of God. And so this uh, love is the law, the nature of that law isn't sentimentality, it isn't uh, uh, 
it isn't uh, 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 pity or charity or any, anything like that, although it can manifest in pity and charity and compassion and things like that. The nature of the law, when there's a question between love and will, there shouldn't be. Will wins out because that's what we're here to do. And so the nature of that is love. And love is a, is a force as real as electricity or gravity or, or uh, uh, anything else. It's a real live force. If we had machinery fine enough tuned, we could, we could, uh, uh, plug ourselves in and, and find out our degree of love. Okay. Love is a real force. It mm -hmm. is the fundamental force of, of nature. And so everything is already conforming and existing and executing its function in the, uh, within the context of love. So, you said that, you said that um, in the context of nature, uh, you mentioned love. I mean, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be said that it would be true that only, hum, only humanity is capable of love? Uh, does, do the animals, do the fish, do, do the reptiles, do, are they capable of love in the same capacity as humans? Uh, the atoms wouldn't hold themselves together. Nice. Without love. It's a real good answer. It's a real good answer. So, so uh, yes, we, uh, we had a cricket in our garage that Constance uh, found, and it would sing to us whenever we'd, we'd go to the, 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 the kitchen. And she found the cricket and uh, started talking to the, to the cricket and, and going like that, and the cricket had its little antenna. <laughs> Constance formed a relationship with this cricket, and uh, eventually she set up a little shrine and put up a little Hindu goddess, and, and she fed the cricket, uh, uh, oh, I forget what it was, she, she fed it. And there's not a doubt in my mind that 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 cricket existed in a stream of love that Constance was uh, 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 intimately in tune with. So yes, but it reaches right down. Uh, I wrote a song uh, called uh, "When You Fall in Love." And uh, when you fall in love, you change everything. Sun, moon, galaxies are created. Your genes are mutated when you fall in love. Hmm. Uh, uh, molecules hold themselves together with love. Magnetism is an expression of love. Uh, love is so big and so fundamental that, that uh, even to limit it with a four letter word is blasphemy. <laughs> okay. So, but anyway, of course I may be wrong. All right. Would you, would you agree, would you agree with, with this particular cultic saying, that everything is true in one sense and everything is false in one sense, but everything is permissible. Would you agree or disagree with that statement? I, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, once you break into duality mm -hmm. uh, and there's your true and your untrue right there, uh, you've already fallen so far away from the, the pristine singularity of consciousness that that uh you could you could get into a bar fight over it and but everybody would uh 
uh, be right and wrong at the same time. Everything is permissible. Okay, sometime. <laughs> Mr. Decat, what what's the last what's the last um, book that that you were involved in writing? Uh, what was it? that? My last book was uh, "Allow Me to Introduce." Uh, which was a compilation of about 35 years of my introductions to other people's uh, works. Uh, the one just before that was called The Son of Chicken Kabbalah. The Son of Chicken Kabbalah. It's a What's damn good book. And w was that also a compilation of your years of research into the Kabbalistic uh, systems? No. Magic, or was it just Kabbalah in itself? Or. Uh, I wrote a book called The Chicken Kabbalah of Rabbi Lamed Ben Clifford about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my uh, uh, attempt to uh, uh, wrap my brain around the, the practical aspects of Hermetic Kabbalah. And to do so, I invented a rabbi. Uh, an outrageous, crazy old rabbi, and uh, it's been very popular. And uh, uh, I went to China. I was invited to go to China, in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. but uh, I was to go at every season. Uh, and uh, I had this, the same group of of students, uh, most of whom were uh, uh, professional yeah, healers or mystical kind of people. The, uh, truly, I was the biggest putz in the in the room. Okay, but I was to teach them Kabbalah mm -hmm. and the fundamentals of Kabbalah. Mm. So now. You know, you got to learn a little little Hebrew to uh, uh, have the vocabulary to discuss uh, Kabbalah. Not much. You don't have to speak the language or anything like that. Yeah, but uh, everything is in in uh, deals with the Hebrew alphabet mm -hmm. as, uh, as a tool of understanding. Uh, the mechanics of consciousness. And so I decided that the best way for me to do this in only four three-day uh, sessions uh, would be to uh, literally implant the Hebrew alphabet in a systematic way in the consciousness of the, the students. And so I invented a three-degree Kabbalistic occult order just for the purpose of this off-the-wall, temporary, here's a three-degree occult order, and we're going to join it, and we're going to do it, complete with initiation ceremonies, everything else. That, that systematically take the Hebrew alphabet, three mother letters, seven double letters, and, and 12 simple letters in a three-degree initiatory program where we go through initiations that actually burn into the psyche the meanings, the relevance, the significance of each one of those Hebrew letters. And... Uh, uh, it was it was a crazy thing to do, and I'm the laziest guy in the world, and I should have, uh, oh God. But and then the fourth class was uh, uh, sort of a, uh, or the fourth series weekend uh, was sort of pulling it all together. And uh, I, I I'm sure you're familiar with the formula of of initiation, uh, a well crafted initiation uh, actually uh, initiates a change of consciousness 
Mm -hmm. um, each initiation is a mutation mm -hmm. in your consciousness. You're a different person at the end of every well-crafted initiation. Well, that's what I did. And so when I uh, uh, came home, while it was still fresh in my mind, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to put this entire initiatory process uh, into a book of self-initiation. And uh, so that's what Son of Chicken Kabbalah is, is that three degree initiatory program that you can do in your own house. Uh, you can lock yourself in your bathroom and do, <laughs> and do it to yourself, okay. What do you think your most brilliant work is as far as uh, books, books that you've published? Probably, the most in-depth researched book. Oh, uh, 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 the most researched one is the uh, Enochian Vision Magic. Yeah, that's a favorite. Yeah, that's the, uh, and uh, it's probably tied with Alistair, uh, understanding Alistair Crowley's Thoth Tarot. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Very, very cool. Where does, where does one uh, buy those books? Everywhere. Everywhere. If you've got a local bookstore, even if they charge you a dollar more for the book, order, you can, you can shop for my books. Go to Amazon and see the, the books that you would like to, to order. And you can get them from Amazon. They're cheap and everything else. And I get the same amount of money uh, for it, which is hardly anything. Hmm. Um, but we've got to support our local bookstores. Okay. Hmm. We've got to support them. If you've got one in your neighborhood or in your town, call them up and order the book through them even if you have to get in your car and drive there to pick it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but it's everywhere. It's at uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, even Target, even Walmart, uh, not Walmart, uh, Kmart. Every, wherever books are sold, that's where. Mr. Duquette, um, in your book, Enochian Vision Magic, um, a lot of, a lot of the, there's several transcripts that are taken from the a, a British museum. Um, does that particular British museum have any transcripts uh, that they wouldn't allow access to that you weren't able to get your hands on? Um, well, it's uh, the, the British uh, library uh, where a lot of it is. And the Ashmolean Muse uh, Museum at, at Oxford has most of the uh, between those two has most of the Enochian uh, material. And no, if you know what you're asking for, they don't give a sh <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. British really Library is, is kind of fun because uh, uh, you have to, uh, you have to, it's a three day thing. So you mm -hmm. have to, you have to get an apartment or a flat in London uh, nearby so you can walk over every day uh, uh, first of all you've got to you've got to uh, be registered and have a have a membership card and uh, to somehow justify that you're a scholar mm -hmm. okay and um, and what you're interested in you know so they, they, they got a lot of information on you so you just can't Go in. They'll get you if you take a crayon and, and ruin stuff, you know. Uh, <laughs> you got to do that the first day. Then the second day, you go in. Uh, once they've cleared you, uh, you go in and there's a nice computer kind of catalog thing. And you order what you want to look at. And so you got to know what you want to look at, first of all. Right. Secondly, you got to find it. 
So, you know, well, that's Sloan Manuscript 3188, okay. <laughs> then you submit that, and then you go to the pub and drink yourself to sleep. And then the next morning, you go again and say, I'm here to, here to look at the stuff. And they, they, there's a guy with a, a little cart, and he comes driving up with a little cart with, with, your, uh, with your books or your manuscripts or your folios. And they give you a room of your own, a little, it's bigger than a cubicle, but smaller than a, a room with a, with a lamp that uh, is kind of a safety bulb of some kind. And uh, uh, Mr. Duquette, did you see the original um, sigil of DMF? Yes. You saw the original? Yeah, oh, you can too. It's right there in the King's Gallery at the British Museum. Very cool. Very cool. Every time I go there, I try to I try to jumpstart it. The, um, <laughs> the uh, it, it's right there by the the, the sigillums there plus his mirror. When well, you said you tried to jumpstart it, what, what yeah. do you mean by that, Mister Duquette? Well, I kind of move in and get my nose close to the glass. Mm -hmm. And then I recite the 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 first call, the first right. Enochian call, and look at my face in the in the mirror, and then a, a dozen appears mm -hmm. <laughs> behind me. Okay, nothing to see here. Move along. Move along. <laughs> Very interesting, and I'm and I'm sure and I'm sure by now uh, they know who you are when you visit. What's that? When you when you do have access to when you when you did visit the the Sigillum DMF, uh, you said that you recited the first call, the Enochian call, the first one, and that somebody had appeared behind you that would said, uh, "Miss, can you please move along?" I was just oh, I am you're joking. Oh, you're um, joking. Well, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. They, uh, I do, I I do do the call. Okay. Uh, very cool. Uh, but, you know, it's not really an environment. There's hundreds of people milling right. around and things like that. Yeah. It's just that. Uh, uh, but anyway, and it's moved around the exhibit. And everybody, uh, the museum's really conscious that it's a, it's a, of interest to a lot of people now. Mm -hmm. And so they've got it in a case of its own, along with the golden talisman and uh, uh, three of the small wax sigillums that uh, are under the under the legs of the table, mm -hmm. and a little card with John D. stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a in Washington D.C. There is a, a museum called the International Spy Museum. Mm -hmm. And it's really cute, and it's got exhibits from uh, from Cold War stuff, and it's got you know, yeah. But it's got a whole case of John D. Wow, of John D. Well, you know that they, they don't have John D. Uh, you know they don't have his jock strap or anything like that. They, but they've got. Uh, uh, you know, lots of lots of kind of pictures and and uh, drawings and a big. They treat him as the first international spy, the first James Bond. Mm -hmm. Well, Mister Duquette, we're we're almost to the end of the hour. Oh, uh, but I I ask you, well, it, time does fly. Um, I do want to ask you one more question. Uh, you got a lot of younger occultists out there. And uh, that are looking at you like, wow, this is a really cool, old school, hippie dude, kind of a cultist, man. And, and they study your books. You know, uh, I've studied your books, too, probably, you know, 15 years ago. Um, what would be your advice to the new occultist um, today? Uh, you know, as, as long as you're passionate about studying this stuff, study it. Uh, don't be afraid to practice stuff. Uh, uh, even if you don't think you understand uh, what you're doing, 
you'll never think that you understand what you're doing. Uh, so enjoy it. But most of all, continue to have a life. So don't let it consume you, in other words. Well, uh, if being consumed is part of your life, let it do that. But have other things, have other things going for you, too. Very cool. You'll you'll eventually see that absolutely everything you do is magic. Hmm. And uh, uh, so just don't stop doing stuff. <laughs> Mr. Duquette, thank you so much for being on The Lone Wolf Show. I'm The Lone Wolf. That's Moon Hysteria. This is Lawn Milo Duquette, and we love you. <laughs>